Thank you very much. Um, glass making at Nasseri Abbey is one of those areas that has received quite a considerable amount of attention, um, actually from the very onset of the 1950s when in 1955, the first evidence uh, was found for glassmaking activity at the Abbey, thus the picture up there. Um, and as soon as evidence for what very quickly came apparent to be early medieval glassmaking, not later medieval glassmaking, um, came to attention, Radford actually sent for Harden and got Dennis Harden along, Dennis Donald Harden along, um, who was at the time the acknowledged uh, leading glass expert um, in, in the UK, and Harden took a very direct interest in the glassworking activity at the Abbey and ended up directing uh, parts of the excavations of the furnace structures. More recently, in the 1990s, or 1980s, culminating in a publication in 1990, Justine Bailey re-evaluated much of this evidence for Saxon glassmaking, but as we've heard before, at that time, much the, the archive was not available for consultation. It was under the Jacobean bed. And she was mainly relying upon um, Harden's own notes um, and limited numbers of finds. So with the reintegration of the archive um, and its fuller examination, um, the scope for a more contextualized um, um, examination of glassmaking is now possible. Um, and this also comes um, in connection with the development of analytical techniques that has taken place in the last 20 years. So together, uh, myself and my colleague Kate Wellen will be talking about this. I'm going to talk about reanalyzing the stratigraphy of the, of the glass making activity, and Kate will talk about uh, the glass and other interesting developments itself. So given the considerable amount of documentation and new finds that have come to light more recently, only a brief summary of this can be presented here today. So I'm going to concentrate on those elements for which there was less av information available in the 1990 report. Given the high degree of stratigraphic overlap between what were identified as furnaces at the time and some of the ambiguities that exist between what are now thought to be furnaces, I'm going to discuss the evidence relative to the areas in which it was found. Having said that, um, from the very onset, uh, Radford and then Harden numbered these furnaces, and in our current study we have kept the numbering of the furnaces to avoid confusion um, with earlier literature. But as you'll see, we think there are differences in the number of furnaces that originally were thought. The first area of glassmaking um, that was identified was here in area A. All the glassmaking occurs within the cloister or the cloister walk area of the abbey. Um, one intriguing possibility, of course, is that where trenches are here um, have obviously hit furnaces, but there may well be um, further archaeological evidence that was not hit by these rather sort of slim trenches. Now, the first area is area A here um, in the northeast of the cloister. This was identified when a long, thin east-west cloister trench was excavated and rather fortuitously, the main furnace structure, which is this area here, falls within the confines of that trench. Subsequently, a second trench in 1956, the year afterwards, was excavated to the south, which also contained glass making evidence. And because of this, uh, the area between was also opened up. Now, Talking about the problems of contemporary documentation and how you interpret them, this is the only surviving plan from 1955 when the first furnace was discovered, and this is drawn by Harden. Um, and there's a sort of very schematic plan there and an even more ambiguous section. Um, however, this shows an oval furnace measuring about 1.8 meters by 1.2 meters externally and orientated on the east-west axis with a stoke hole at its west end. Rather confusingly, this plan is actually drawn around the wrong way. Um, so the stoke hole appears at the east end. Um, Harden and the plan describe a curb, which is the feature running around the outside, approximately 13 centimeters wide. And this presumably is what remained of the furnace wall. Several sections were drawn across the furnace. And from these and Harden's contemporary descriptions, it's clear that the floor of the furnace was formed, at least in part, from a layer of reused Roman tiles and clay burnt red from the heat of the furnace. The floor was not flat, rather taking the form of a shallow depression 12 centimeters deep at 
a central point. Above the floor is deposited a four to six centimeter layer described variously as yellow or dirty clay, which in turn was overlain by a further layer at least 11 centimeters thick, described as charcoal and clay, clay and ash, or tile, ash, and clay. And it is from this layer that probably uh, originally was the, the dome of the furnace, which has collapsed or been demolished in on the top of the furnace remains once it's gone out of use. And it's from this layer that the significant proportion of the glass finds, as well as the larger pieces of furnace superstructure, were recovered. The re-excavation of the northern furnace in 1956 uh, revealed the remains of what has sometimes been thought to be a second furnace down here. So this is the area of the first furnace. Um, and here is the area of the second furnace. Unfortunately, very little is known about the second furnace. Its outline is only discernible on this one plan drawn by Peter Hart. It's approximately the same size and orientation as furnace one, although its eastern end has been disturbed. However, some doubt can be cast on the, the validity of this structure as a furnace. Writing in August, August 1956, Kay Wainwright recorded in the site notebook that um, more glass-making debris is found in this area, but at this stage, and I quote, there appears to be no recognizable pattern that might betray a kiln. Three days later, Harden took over the writing of the site diary and was first to record an other more apparently in situ. This brief description and the outline on this Hart plan provide the only primary documentation that survives for Furnace II, and therefore any conclusions about its form must be tentative. Indeed, as I've sort of suggested, it's entirely possible that this was never actually a furnace. And an alternative explanation for what was observed is that the feature was in fact a compressed spread of kiln debris, derived perhaps originally from Furnace 1 to the north. The superstructure of this first furnace can be reconstructed, reconstructed from both recorded and surviving elements. The plan made of the top of the furnace on this initial discovery, and that's what you can see on the screen there, shows a line of tile fragments forming an arc around both the southern and northern portions of the so-called burnt um, tile and ash layer. So here you have tiles. This is that burnt layer which is in the center of the kiln. So you've got an arc of tiles around the kiln. And you've got to bear in mind, this is a top slice that's truncating the stratigraphy. It's not being excavated in a modern sense. Um, the purpose of these tiles is perhaps clearer in a photograph that survives, and this is the only surviving photograph of Furnace 1 here. And here you can see those same tiles. You can see the exactly the same tiles shown there. Um, but here in the photograph, it's clear that they are all tipping into the furnace at an angle of around 45 degrees. The tiles to the north can be seen to be intentionally laid on top of each other, indicating that the wall of the furnace, which has been truncated through the excavation here, was constructed from reused Roman tiles bonded in clay, at least at this lower level. More diagnostic are two portions of fire clay apertures recovered from the top of the furnace. These are two small ribbing gathering holes, which are the holes that the glass maker actually takes the glass out of the furnace from. Um, and instead, we're probably set towards the top of the furnace and we used to let the gases escape from the furnace and allow the glass maker to regulate the temperature of the furnace by covering or opening these holes as appropriate. Um, as no other furnaces of Saxon date have been excavated to provide comparison for reconstructions of the Glastonbury examples, there is the exception of the furnace at Barking Abbey, uh, but this remains unpublished and is problematic in many senses we need to look to other sources to reconstruct what the Saxon furnace was like. Recent experimental work undertaken by Mark Taylor and David Hall has provided an extremely useful analogy for Glastonbury. Although their reconstructions are of ancient Roman furnaces, some aspects are sufficiently close to the Glastonbury evidence to merit comparison. In particular, a relevant observation made by Taylor and Hill uh, was the effect of the prolonged exposure to heat, uh, the long the prolonged exposure heat had on the furnace structure over time. They observed that even though the main walls had been built using Roman tiles and bonded horizontally in their reconstructions, very much like we're proposing for the three furnaces, when the three-week firing period of the furnace was over and the structure was deconstructed, all the tiles were found sloping inwards towards the center of the furnace. Um, 
the suggestion being here that you know long period of exposure to heat has caused a degradation in the tiles and the matrix holding the tiles and the furnace is effectively starting to sink inwards. The Saxon furnace may well have been affected in a similar way through prolonged exposure to heat and the presence of tile dipping inwards that are shown in that photograph I think are the evidence for that. Um, a very significant quantity of kiln superstructure and glass making debris is recovered from this area although it's unfortunate that many of the more diagnostic uh, pieces have since been lost. Many of the original finds bags, though, as Cheryl was indicating before, um, include detailed descriptions of their find locations written upon them, and there's just an example up there. And these have been fully transcribed in the online catalog of all the finds. In most cases, this included the trench itself, an easting relative to either the eastern or western edge of the trench, and a depth of recovery. This detail allows the partial reconstruction of the original find locations, and two distribution maps have been produced to show the fine spots of furnace material and slag relating to furnaces one and two. And this is what you're seeing on the screen now. I haven't got time to go into these in detail, but because the, the trench is very narrow, you at least get um, a, a sense of where the artifacts were coming from, and the distributions are different between the structural evidence and the evidence for glass working, which is concentrated at the mouth of the furnace or just outside the furnace. <laughs> um, a second area of glass making was identified uh, five meters to the west of the original um, glass making area. Um, this was first found on the opening of another east-west running trench across the cloister during 1956, and this area again was reopened in 1957. A single furnace was identified, and this is probably the best recorded of all the furnaces, and this is the one that Justine Bailey was able to say the most about in her publication, so I'm not going to concentrate on it too much here. Um, the form of the industrial features are relatively easy to reconstruct in plan and consist of two elements, an oval furnace, which is here on another plan by Peter Hart, um, attached to which is a stoking pit to the south. Um, both features are of similar size to the furnaces excavated in the first area. Um, it's clear from the records that whilst the furnace was itself fully excavated, the stoking pit was not, and only this area here of the stoking pit was actually excavated, making the reconstruction of its exact form difficult. The floor of the furnace um, in this area was formed uh, from a, a layer of redeposited clay, and in both sections it appears as a shallow depression 24 centimetres deep, just as it's with Furnace 1. Um, and this is likely to have been part of the original design of the furnace. The outer wall of the furnace was also detected in the northern area of the excavation, in the, and, but not in the south, and perhaps was truncated there. Although it's not shown on the excavation plan, which I showed you just before, it can be seen in several of the photographs, and it's also recorded in this section. Here. You can't quite read the writing there, but that actually is indicating a mortar spread, which is the edge at the very bottom of the wall. I want to move on, though, perhaps to the most interesting area of glassmaking on the site, and the one that the recent work has really emphasised the importance of. In 1957, a further area to the southeast between the cloister walk within the area, the East Cloister Walk was opened. Um, this was initially part of a long-running trench here that then was extended to the south to form a box. This is orientated the other way, so north is up this end here. On reading Harden's notebook, it is clear that at no point did either Harden or Radford positively identify a furnace in situ here. However, it now may be suggested that portions of not one two different furnaces were encountered in this area based on the north and south sections. So this is the north section and the south section of this box here. <coughs> Within this area of excavation, extensive uh, spread of burnt clay mixed with glass and slag was found, covering the majority of the trench. And you can see it's here, this bit here. And this extends into the southern box here as well. So you've got an arc of burnt red clay, which is overlain with an area of what is called in various descriptions blue clay, blue lias clay, or redeposited clay. 
this relationship can be seen in the surviving section and photograph uh, taken, the photograph is taken standing from the north looking to the south of this area. Um, particularly in this, this section here, which is, wasn't available for original analysis, it's actually marked furnace in situ, which is the corresponds to this band of burnt clay here. You've then got the blue clay that overlies it at a 45 degree angle, and then there's a further area of blue clay here. There's something else that's been cut into it there. Um, what we're actually suggesting here is that, in fact, you're looking at the furnace itself. This is the edge of the furnace. You have the wall of the furnace. There's even Roman tile mentioned as in the section there lying above it. And we're perhaps at the top of the furnace itself, which then, when it's gone out of use, has been overlaid with this redeposited blue clay. This was never excavated into. Um, finally, we also have uncovered an intriguing suggestion that there is a second furnace uh, to the north, and one that was never identified before. Um, this is the section of the plan which clearly shows an area of a raised area of burnt clay in the northeast corner of this original trench. Harden sketches this in his notebook, but assumes it's the same as the burnt context to the south. However, a drawing of the north section of this by Radford clearly shows a bowl-like depression, um, which is even annotated kiln, um, which directly corresponds to the raised area of red clay in plan. The lack of comment from Harden concerning this feature can be explained by the fact that it was only visible in a small boxed extension to the original section, and this may well have been cut after Harden had left the site. The feature is a familiar form to others we have seen, a depression 17 centimetres deep and 82 centimetres wide, cut into what is apparently natural clay. And as only the edge of the furnace was in section, its full diameter must have been so much larger. The floor of the furnace was formed from the underlying clay that had been fired red to a depth of 25 centimetres. And the primary fill directly on top of the floor was deposited was a deposit of small stones, burnt clay and ash. It seems to represent the final firing of the furnace. Although only tentative evidence remains for a previously unrecognised fifth furnace at Glastonbury, the recent reanalysis of the material suggests there is a good case for one. The southern edge of this fifth furnace is at least a metre and a half away from the closest point of the northern edge of the furnace to its south, a uh, sufficient distance that both could have been conceivably in operation at the same time, although the absence of a clear stratigraphic relationship between them makes this impossible to say for certain. Thank you, Hugh. Um, I'd now like to talk to you a bit more about the glassmaking practices at Glastonbury and uh, the dating of the site. Um, since Glastonbury, the glassmaking was excavated in the 50s, our knowledge of early medieval glassmaking sites um, has developed substantially, um, but actually it's still significantly hampered by our lack of archaeological evidence um, from this time. With the exception of 11 crucial fragments uh, found in a pit um, relating to the 6th century uh, date at Buckton in Cambridgeshire, uh, which were probably actually connected with bead making. Um, there's really little comprehensive evidence for glass manufacture in England for the second half of the 7th century. Historically, the first references occur in the 70s uh, at York and at Wearmouth, and there seems to be a strong connection between the reintroduction of the glass industry and the establishment and refounding of monasteries in the late 7th century. Now, I, I set this scene for you because when we first started this project, and indeed all the previous work, had led us to believe that the glassmaking at Glastonbury uh, was in fact most likely to be of the date around about the mid 10th century. This had always been somewhat uncertain, it was based on strategically, and you can see the challenges involved with that uh, through the talk this morning. Um, however, there had always been a question mark because Vera Addison had identified the glass vessel fragments typologically probably belonging to the 7th or 8th centuries. The problem with that, of course, is that glass can be recycled, and there was always a question whether these were just old bits of glass that were being kept to be remelted and turned into something else. Glastonbury itself, as you've seen from what Hugh's shown you, you'll see in my later slides, is one of the most comprehensive and wide-ranging sets of archaeological glass-making material we have 
in the early medieval period. So therefore, getting a good date for Glastonbury is absolutely crucial. We were extremely fortunate as part of this project um, to be able to conduct radiocarbon dating. And I'd like to thank the generous support of the Morgan Fund and um, the Society of Medieval Archaeology for making this possible. Um, because we were able to take five samples um, of charcoal, three from the area around furnaces one and two from the 1955 period, and two from the later 1956 period. And you'll see from the next slide that the results were quite um, significant and very exciting for myself and Hugh when we first saw them. Taken together, the dates obtained provide a broad age range for the, um, the furnaces of 605 to 882 AD. But we can actually narrow this to 605 to 780 AD as the period at which all the ranges of the highest probability overlap at about two sigma. Both samples one and two, I should say, suffer slightly from coinciding with a small plateau in the radiocarbon calibration curve, which has the effect of stretching uh, the range. But the sample three doesn't and has a much tighter range of 605 to 685 AD. Given that all of these three first samples are securely stratified to within furnace one, um, and essentially therefore are the, the same age in radiocarbon terms, we can, in probability, interpret these as being indicative of activity in the latter part of the 7th century AD and around the 680s. Two further samples, you'll see here samples 4 and 5, uh, come from 1956. Number 4 is coming from the floor of the furnace, as described as a number 5 within and under the kiln. Now, with these two, it's actually difficult to tell whether they're from furnace 1 or from furnace 2, although in the case of uh, the sample number four is most likely to be furnace two because the, the floor of furnace one was actually cleared in, in 1955. But essentially what we can see is that the whole phase of glass making in this area was taking place at Glastonbury in the late 7th or early 8th centuries AD and in all probability this can be narrowed down to the last decade of the 7th century. So this makes Glastonbury one of the most important sites we have and some of the earliest, most comprehensive evidence for glass making. It also, of course, confirms Vera Everson's original identifications of, of the glass and links it well into that. So her typological um, suggestion based on typology um, was indeed correct. Um, and it ties in, uh, as she suggested, with a major building campaign at, at the Abbey, because we can see that the broad date of the glass furnaces actually falls within the reign of King Ing, and although we don't know much about the monastery um, that he founded at Glastonbury, we do see that there are some stone foundations relating to the late 7th and early 8th century church underneath the western end of the later medieval nave. So now, whilst we haven't got any glass or glazing associated with this early phase, I think we can say that in all probability the glass making was there to provide both window glass and vessel glass for the, the early monastery and the community around it. And once again, what it does is confirm the relationship between the glass making and ecclesiastical institutions in the 7th century, uh, as, as seen at York and Wynnath, and indeed as suggested by Professor Cramp, as uh, um, she's highlighted the issue of window glass and other monastic sites, including Brandon, Flixborough, and Barking. And we do also see a correlation between early glass use, if not production, um, in Ireland as well. So, very exciting early glass material, but what does the assemblage actually consist of, and what can we tell from looking at it? Um, compared to other glass sites, as I've shown you, uh, it contains a wide range of materials. So I'm just going to take you through a few of the highlights of it and talk about some of the specifics that we found. Hugh's already discussed the extensive furnace evidence, but we also have crucible evidence um, at Glastonbury. So glass would have been melted in small ceramic crucibles. Um, with, they were deliberately designed to be able to withstand the high temperatures that glass needs to be melted. Um, we have a number of these here. You can see that they've all got green-blue glass in them. 
And we also can see that their shape uh, is quite similar to those found at Jarrow, established in 682 AD. The crucibles are indeed extremely interesting because the closer examination of their fabric has shown that they are actually made from a refined ore clay. Now, this particular clay, the closest source of it is on the Isle of Purbeck, um, but the same stratum also outcrops across in northern France. So, what's very interesting is the relationship of form with there and also the, the clay with this potential French origin might lead us to believe that, as with Professor Pant's suggestion that the uh, Jarrow glass makers were coming from Gaul, that maybe the same could be said about Glastonbury. We have a range of glass blowing and glass working evidence um, on the site. Um, what you can see here is a collection of those things. What we have um, are a lot of moils along the bottom. So this line along here, the glass moils, and these are the small pieces of glass that would have been attached to the blowing iron when the glass vessel was produced. And some of them still contain little bits of iron oxide, the little black bits you can see on the images that have come off the blowing iron. And you can see there's a whole range of these. There are also threads and pores you see on the, the top uh, right of the slide um, in a range of different colours. And very excitingly, um, there's the potential that we may indeed have a fragment of blowing iron and a sort of lump of uh, rather inauspicious looking um, brown stuff on the left of your screen is actually a corroded piece of iron. And um, in x ray, you can see that there does appear, in fact, be a tube running right the way through it. And this was found associated with the glass material. Difficult to say whether it was definitely a blowing iron, um, but very interesting find that nonetheless. We know that glass makers at Glastonbury were producing both vessel glass, they were also producing window glass. Um, they made glass, uh, they used a number of different colours. Uh, the predominant colour is blue green, but we also see browns and reds and purples. And they were using different forms of decoration. You can see this beautiful fragment of turquoise and op opaque white reticello wood down at the, bo the bottom. We also, of course, see the less glamorous part of glass making, which is the waste. And you mentioned Roman tiles earlier. And the fact that you can see here is a piece of Roman tile with turquoise glass still attached. And there are considerable numbers of these within the assemblage, some of them, of course, incredibly burnt um, and suffering from uh, very severe vitrification. And there are lumps of glass slag and cullets and, and general waste as well. So taking the whole assemblage um, together, one of the first questions really that uh, we wish to ask about glass making is whether glass is produced from primary or secondary production. And I know someone asked me this at Copy and I refuse to tell them, so here's the answer. <laughs> so, um, for those of you not familiar with the difference between the two, um, primary production is where glass is produced from its raw materials, so sand and a flux that reduces the melting temperature of the sand, and that would either be natron, which is a mineral source, or palm ashes. This is normally quite difficult to do and requires quite high temperatures. Much more easy, in technological terms, is secondary production where essentially you take some recycled glass, waste glass, glass pellets, as we call it, uh, and remelt it. This is much easier to do and requires lower temperatures. So, <laughs> which was it at Glastonbury? Well, previous work had already suggested that it probably was secondary glass production. And indeed, when Hugh and I investigated the assemblage again, there is no evidence that we can see for primary glass production. And this is, is not really probably very surprising for the time, because we already know that the glass is of a solar lime silica composition, and that is a, a Roman style composition. So it fits with the already existing pattern of early medieval materials manufactured in the Roman tradition. Since the previous analysis, though, done back in the 1990s, we now know that it's very well established that the majority of early medieval glass appears to be related in some ways to some very large production centres in the Near East and the Mediterranean. Um, these furnaces, to give you some idea, some of them were producing up to eight tonnes of glass in one year. 
these were not small operations. Um, and they were breaking up these pieces of glass and they were being transported around to be broken down, to be remelted as part of secondary production. We also know through recent work using um, trace elements analyses and isotopic analyses um, that we can correlate much more strongly now between the raw materials of glass production and production centres, um, giving us a better idea of how these materials are moved around time. And this is really a significant development in glass studies and one that's happened um, over the last five to ten years of work of people like Ian Caristo and Julian Henderson. So, with the gasoline material, we had an opportunity to reanalyze the glass and also to place a lot more of the glass artifacts actually in a better context. And you saw the um, positional um, diagrams that Hugh put up earlier. So we had a much clearer idea of where things came from because we had a much better idea from the archive and all the little notes on the, on the envelopes. And so we reanalyzed the range of glasses, different colors, different furnace areas, um, and different, different types. And the compositional data confirmed that the majority of glass samples are, as we previously thought, so the lime silica glass. Um, they fall into this Roman type tradition. You can see a crucible fragment here. We analyzed three crucibles, and actually we found that the composition was incredibly tight between them, suggesting that maybe there was contemporaneous use and that you know there was something going on there all there at the same time, which is maybe not, not terribly surprising. Unfortunately, it wasn't very easy to see any particular split between the other artifact types. So the vessel, the window, the glass working waste, they're close in composition, but you can't definitively link them to a, a furnace. Um, there's clearly a great variety in use of colorants, um, such as the use of tin oxide in the opaque white glass on the Reticello rod you saw earlier. And indeed, this is in common with the, the type of um, compositions we see from the glass in the British Isles at this time. We also carried out isotopic analysis, both strontium and neodymium, uh, to look at the potential provenance of the glass. And the results were as expected for the natron base for the soda based glasses of this time, with the strontium ratios reflecting the inclusion in the base composition of modern marine shell from a calcareous sand. And the neodymium reflects an eastern Mediterranean origin of the sand in the base composition. So what does this tell us? Well, whilst it's highly likely that the Glastonbury glass can actually be traced back to these large production centres in the Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean, the recyclable nature of glass does actually mean that the glass that we see here could have had quite a complex life cycle. And there's been quite a number of studies that have suggested that there may have been Roman recycled pieces of cullet as well exploited in addition to this glass coming in from uh, the eastern Mediterranean. How does it fit into other sites? Well, what we can do with Glastonbury now we have a new analysis is suggest that similar conclusions can be drawn for Glastonbury as those suggested by Ian Freestone for the Jaro material. And indeed, compositionally, um, the Glastonbury material can be seen to be actually quite similar to the Wearmouth group of um, glass composition, which was identified by Robert Brill as part of that, those set of uh, analyses. The Glastonbury glass itself fits closer with the material from the production centres of Levantine 1 and Bel Elietta, I pronounced that wrong, Bel Elietta, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And these were in operation. Um, in the first half, in the second half of the first millennium. So therefore, as at Weymouth and Gero, although the Glastonbury material probably does have a bit of Roman recycled um, colour in it as well, it indicates the introduction of glass from these primary production sites in the Eastern Mediterranean at this time. It fits well within the compositional picture we now have for early medieval glass in the 6th to 8th centuries. And it's clear that glassmakers at Glastonbury were producing blue-green glass vessels and windows using a mixture of, of colour. They were using coloured glass for decoration, but we don't as yet, although we have a couple of coloured moils, there's no crucible evidence that shows coloured glass being melted. So just to summarise, um, I think what's been absolutely fantastic being part of this project 
absolutely hard work by Shell and Bedford. You've seen from Shell's talk just how challenging it was to get the information together. Has allowed myself and Hugh for the first time to be able to reevaluate all of the extant material um, and recatalog it anew. Um, and some of the Augustine glass went as far as wide as to America and Sheffield, not so glamorous. Um, <laughs> we've seen um, that the uh, uh, evidence for glass making is located in three separate areas. Um, and importantly, whereas before we thought we had four glass furnaces, we now think we actually have five. Um, with respect to glass making practices, there's absolutely clear parallels between the Glastonbury furnaces and the experimental furnace produced by uh, Mark Taylor and David Hill that Hugh mentioned earlier. And they demonstrated that this style of furnace could well have been successfully operated at temperatures of over 1,000 degrees C, and they ran it for three weeks when they tried it. Uh, that's day and night. It doesn't, you go turn off glass furnaces before you get them going. <laughs> um, so it's very striking, the parallels between those two, and their use, and David and Mark's use of the recycled Roman tiles as well. And finally, I think one of the most significant things that's come out of this project has been the redating of the glass and green furnaces. And that we can now, you know, effectively say that the glass making can be associated with the refounding of the monastery, rather than relating to the much later date. And given this date, um, Glastonbury fits into a much wider practice, pattern of practice that is now emerging, where there's a very clear and distinct connection between glass making and the church. And it's likely that the glass makers at Glastonbury were of similar continental origin to those historically known to have been at Wearmouth and other English sites. So I'd just like to finish there and thank the very um, generous cooperation of everyone who 